Yeah. We're going to go ahead and call the uh, special meeting to order for uh, March 22nd. And can we begin with a, uh, we're going to swear in new directors. Are they here? Maybe. Okay, so we're going to have to hold off on that. All right, then we'll, we're going to go ahead and move to a roll call. Here. Director Hoffman Gomez. Present. Director Gonzalez. Present. Director Leopold. Director Lynn. Here. Director Matthews. Here. Director Myers. Here. Director McPherson. Director Rothwell. Here. Director Rothman. Ex officio Director Northcutt. Um, can we start at this point to a uh, schedule annual um, Santa Cruz Improvement Corporation SCCIC agenda and we'll begin that with uh, a call to order and what we need to do is consider the appointing of directors Bodorf, Leopold, McPherson, and Gonzalez to serve as the SCCIC board members. Uh, can we do a roll call for this group? Uh, Director Bodorf? Here. Director Leopold? Director McPherson, Director Kaufman Gomez, present, and Director Gonzalez, present. And we have a quorum. Okay, good. Um, are there any oral or written communications? No. Uh, any additions or deletions to the agenda? I'm sorry. Buzz. I'm sorry, Buzz. I didn't see you. Yeah, well, I was wrong. Are you here for the, this is a special committee meeting not to do with uh, or, oral communication. Oral communication? No, no, this no, this no, is no, for no, no, just the meeting. SCCI meeting. Yeah, oh, this is yeah. not for the regular meeting. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to make sure I let you speak, okay? But yeah, this isn't the right time. Uh, yes, and that takes us to additions and deletions to the agenda. None? Okay. This is just the SCCIC meeting. Um, we did not. I'll take a motion to vote on those officers. Yeah. I'll make a motion that we approve the officers. Uh, Mr. Gnoll, you can uh, second that. Okay, I'll second it. Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries to appoint those officers. Thank you for that. Okay, okay and then that takes us to, uh, we need a motion to approve the prior year minutes. From one of the two members here. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve. Motion? I'll second the motion. Second. Okay, motion to approve the minutes for 2018. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Um, and then we have the acceptance of the financial statements. And at this point, I'll turn it over to okay. keep going. All right, well, then I need a motion to accept the financial statements of 2018. I so moved. I'll move. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That carries. And that was a simple, that will adjourn uh, the, the, to the next SCCI board meeting next year, and we will now go back to our regular schedule and reconvene the board of directors meeting. Thank you for everybody's patience for allowing us to do that. And Angela, thank you for your backup assistance. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna go with the announcement. I wanna uh, announce that Carlos Landaberry is here to, to uh, do, as our Spanish interpreter. Carlos, if you would come up and uh, share everybody uh, some information. Thank you. Good morning. Buenos días, directores. Carlos Andaler, your interpreter. Para las personas que prefieren español, voy a estar en la parte de atrás. Thank you. And I just want to announce that today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz, and our uh, individual doing that is Mr. Lynn Dutton. Thank you, Lynn, for doing that. Okay, at this point, we now have a regularly scheduled meeting, and we have oral and written communications to the board. So anybody would like to come up? Please uh, introduce yourself and uh, go ahead. Okay, um, 
My name is Buzz Anderson. I'm a resident of Lago. Uh, grew up in Capitola and lived there all my life. Uh, recently retired. Uh, I simply want to urge the Metro Board to continue to advocate for better bus service in Santa Cruz. Buses are an integral part of transportation solutions in the county and will become even more important in the coming years. Buses are low polluting, more so as the fleet transitions to electric power. They are affordable, they can access any road in the county, they can transport large volumes of passengers, they are flexible in being able to change routes and schedules, and they can offer different capacities to service an array of ridership demands. But you know all of that. I'd like to remind the board that when communities prioritize expensive fixed rail passenger trains in attempt to solve transportation issues, financial resources for buses diminish. This has happened all over the country to the detriment of all groups of citizens. The truth of the matter is that trains do not attract enough ridership to justify their exorbitant costs. Only in the most dense cities do they make any sense. Trains do not help in alleviate highway congestion, and they require much more tax money for maintenance and subsidies. Statistically, for every new train commuter added, four bus riders are lost. Santa Cruz is not a good fit for a train. Our population is too small, and our jobs are not centralized. Buses better serve our community. The Santa Cruz Metro has strong representation on the local RTC board. Please don't succumb to the idea of a train, no matter how seductive it is presented. An improved bus system is a better fit for our county. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Brian Peebles Trail Now. A lot of people ask me why I have a passion for the trail, and I usually tell them I actually have a passion for transportation. For 30 years I've been involved in transportation, I've written state legislation, managed shuttles and the Caltrain, supporting the Caltrain and the Silicon Valley. I've been on the Silicon Valley Leadership Committee. I have a passion for transportation because it impacts all of us. Each of us feel the pain of transportation, of poor infrastructure. That single mom I think about all the time, having to drive her kids to school, the parents driving over 17, all of us stuck on highway one traffic. Poor transportation impacts all of us. Poor transportation impacts the poor even more so because they don't have the flexibility. I am passionate about improving the quality of our community through transportation. March 13th, I attended the California Transportation Committee meeting down in Los Angeles where Executive Director of Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission was presenting the, trans the train plan. We went to educate the CTC on the facts. Guy talked about a tourist train, about our tax dollars going towards the tourist train. And the surprise to Guy was the California Transportation Commission did not agree with his plan. They actually opposed it. They said 20 years we've been sitting here dealing with this corridor and you come with no plan. They actually said that. We followed up with the facts, giving them details of the RTC's Unified Corridor Study, showing that his proposed plan was really just to save Proposition 116 funds. was not related to improving our transportation at all. CTC did not support the train plan. I was there in Los Angeles. This was March 13th. What people don't understand is the engineering behind transportation. A single highway lane moves 2,000 people an hour. The trail, based off of the Unified Corridor State, is 800 people an hour. 800 people an hour. Think about it. We have three main corridors, Soquel, Highway 1, and the Coastal Corridor. And we have one of them blocked, closed. Keeping the Coastal Corridor closed for 20 years is wrong. It's a false assumption. The Regional Transportation Commission did not understand the California Transportation Commission's position. So I'm here to remind us, we're here to improve transportation because we're all impacted by it. And currently, currently the current plan by our transportation agency is all political, it's not technical. And that's shameful, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else like to address the uh, commission? Okay, we'll go ahead and close uh, oral communications. 
Uh, at this point, I'd like to bring up uh, one of our new ex officio uh, directors, Stephen Preston. Welcome. Hi. And uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, have you sworn in. And uh, uh, Julia, you're going to do that? Yeah. OK, good. So I think you uh, let's see. What do you want to do with the uh, podium? Yeah. Sure. That's fine. Stay right there for now. We'll swear you in, and then you're going to take a seat, OK? Preston. <laughs> I, Stephen Preston. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly, solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith. That I will bear true faith. And allegiance, and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I am about to enter. The duties upon which I am about to enter. Well, Stephen, welcome to the uh, board of directors. Nice to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. Okay, we'll get back on track. Uh, are there any written communications from the MAC? None. Uh, at this point, if, uh, any communications from labor organizations? Okay, James. James Ivanhoe, Smart Local 23. First, I want to say thank you for the Driver Appreciation Day. It was awesome to see you guys out there, Mike on the grill, and everybody serving food and talking. It was awesome to see. I apologize that I wasn't able to be there longer, but I had, you know, I was running around that day. So I just wanted to say thank you. Also, I want to say thank you for all the meetings that I've had with you guys, Aurelio, Ed, Mike, Bruce, Donna, our pending meeting. <laughs> so, and I'm still hoping to meet with the rest of you guys. And, I just want to emphasize how important it is to keep these healthy channels, channels of communication open. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Good morning. Good morning, Joan Jeffries, SCRU. Uh, I'm the SCA chapter president. And I know that we do have a lot, several new directors uh, that I have, haven't had the chance to meet yet, so I hope to be able to do that in the near future. I just wanted to give a brief report, let the board know that SCIU has begun uh, contract negotiations, and so far, so good. We've had uh, two negotiation meetings so far, and things are going smoothly. Okay. That's great news. Any other union representatives? Okay, we will move on. Any additional documentation for you to that? Okay. That uh, brings us to our consent uh, agenda. This is uh, items we usually deal with all in one motion. Is there anybody on the board that would like to pull anything from the consent agenda? Anyone from the public would like to speak on anything on the consent agenda? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Group approval of the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Roger, second by McPherson. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The consent agenda carries unanimously. Okay, that takes us to our regular agenda, and we're going to begin with some longevity awards. Uh, we have two awards, and um, Mr. Rock, I'll have you uh, do the presentations, and I'll go uh, award these. Okay. Is your intention to read the full information? I'm sorry, what? Would you like me to read the full information? Absolutely, why not? Okay, okay. Well, who are we going to start with? Elmer Torres, if he's presenting here. Come on up, Elmer. Mm -hmm. Elmer uh, has worked for us for a couple of years. We hope before you hear from him. He attended El Palomar High School in La Libertad, El Salvador. He came to Santa Cruz in La Libertad, El Salvador shortly after the armed conflict there. He married Billy Vett. Torres, August 22nd, 1998. He's a parent of two sons, Amaras Torres and uh, Josaya Torres. He started working at Metro as a custodial service worker in 1999. He was promoted to facilities worker one in 2000. 
and promoted the facilities work to two in 2011. It's quite, quite a career here with us. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. right there and a great crew that we work with and uh, we get to see everyone around here Mr. Clifford always friendly to me and uh, I remember seeing you 20 years ago <laughs> 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 to visit us at the uh, facility I think uh, up of Roman right right I said, Who's that guy? <laughs> <laughs> so well thank you very much for this years um, I've been great and I'm looking forward to the next Thank you. 20 years, great topic. And next we have Isaac Holly, who's also here for 20 years. And let me tell you a couple of things. First of all, not getting down here. If you understand the modern world, you understand that this one person is responsible for us all being able to do anything in this district. <laughs> He's in charge of the technology that, we, that keeps this district growing, and probably in transportation we depend more on, tra on technology than lots of other spheres in life, and so he's a key player here. But just so you know a little bit more about him outside of that, um, he enjoys playing various musical instruments, composing and engineering music, motorcycling and travel. He's also a foodie, you wouldn't know what to look at him, but he's a foodie <laughs> and enjoys cooking and fine dining. So well, he's uh, really the yeah, workout regime I have. <laughs> <laughs> a trade off. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's amazing to think. I started out at 231 like, you know, downtown, and uh, the IT department, actually the MIS department at the time, with Terry Gale upstairs in the Bosco building next door. And uh, when it got busy, he would start. Sorry, <laughs> Twitch going. Some of you may have never called this. Work, yeah. I haven't <coughs> developed that Twitch as of yet. <laughs> but, uh, there's still time. But it's, yeah, there's still time. <laughs> but it's been an honor to become a leader here at, at San Luis Metro. It's been a great career opportunity. And uh, we have a great family here. Uh, operators, staff, management. We're great groups. And uh, I look forward to meeting Thank you for your question. All right. Uh, okay, this is now our presentation. We have the Santa Cruz County Operational Plan Progress Report, and we have Matt Bashada to give us a presentation. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Matt Machado. I'm representing Santa Cruz County today. I'm one of the deputy CAOs and I'm the director of public works. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time, giving me the time today to uh, to share with you a brief presentation on our county effort to operational under strategic plan. Make sure I get this one right direction here. Oh, great. And so I'll just dig right in. Um, Today I'd like to provide a, a brief overview um, of our county strategic plan. I'll provide an update on the operational planning process and an overview of the operational plan elements. Then I'll provide uh, an update on, uh, on our efforts. And finally, I'll briefly discuss next steps and uh, give you an opportunity to provide comment if you have any. So our strategic plan is a result of a year-long effort where we engaged thousands of citizens and staff um, to develop our vision, our mission, and our values, as you see here, as well as six focus areas related with related goals. So the six areas that we developed for focus are here are listed here. We also have these with their descriptions on our website. And uh, the website is sccvision.us. Today we'll focus on reliable transportation, because that's what you all do, and uh, we do that as well. So together, we can make that a, uh, a better process and uh, better results. So let's talk about the, the plan hierarchy here. So this diagram shows the hierarchy of our strategic plan and operational plan elements. The strategic plan serves as our north star of providing a vision of the future. The operational plan will provide our approach 
for strategic plan implementation. This first two, the first two-year operational plan will establish our countywide strategies uh, with department objectives and key steps for achieving the 24 strategic plan goals. This will be an important step in changing our county culture and collaborating with departments and other stakeholders to achieve the vision of the strategic plan. Over time, the operational plan will fully integrate with continuous process improvement, performance measurement, and the new two-year budget that the county is proposing currently. So how did we get here? Over the past year and a half or so, as the county developed our strategic plan, we listened to our community, over 3,000 community voices, uh, staff, over 1,000 staff from, from our departments, partners, um, and we created 180 objectives, department objectives. So each department came up with, with quite a few objectives that we'll be able to measure and focus on. So the point here is to develop the operational plan, not in a vacuum, but rather to take into account existing input and goals of, of all. So department collaboration is a priority. And this is a, a piece of artwork that we developed, and it really shows the connectivity between departments. And I'll, I'll point out that the, the thickness of the line is the, is the magnitude of the interaction between departments, and for instance, I represent public works, so if you look at public works and how we connect to planning up in the top left, that's a rather thick line because that's the type of interaction that we have. But you'll see that many, many departments interact with each other, and so collaboration is clearly the key. We're also working on embedding our county values and our strategies. The county provides services and support and supports partnerships built on these values. We, you see them here listed in the, in the table. For today's meeting, we, uh, we did provide a handout with the 54 draft strategies. Um, the strategy statements describe the county's approach in achieving our strate strategic plan goals. All of the strategies follow the same format. We will act to have an impact. And so this is our framework here. This framework is intended to provide consistency and assist with comprehension of the strategies. They are quite varied, but we <coughs> felt that if we could follow the same format, they would be understandable and relate to each other. I will now discuss strategy development for reliable transportation, which is of utmost importance to all of us here. So under reliable transportation, we developed a subcommittee. Our sub subcommittee was composed of representatives from public works, planning, economic development, human services, health services, and the CAO's office. The strategy we're highlighting today for you is the goal of public transit. We had other goals as well, and I'll share those with you now. They included regional mobility, community mobility, and local roads. The themes that emerged in our discussions of public transit were around increased reliability, equity for people with limited transportation options, and integration of public and alternative modes of transportation. The strategy here speaks to partnering with agencies such as Metro to prioritize development that makes public transportation viable and desirable. Some of the projects or initiatives identified to support this strategy are around planning efforts, such as the coming housing element through our general plan update, and overall transportation planning. Also, we are looking at options within the county that reduce overall traffic, such as opening additional office space in South County. So we have presented these draft strategies to the Board of Supervisors and are now asking this body to consider them as well. In particular, we would like to know what you find useful or important among the strategies. Finally, it is important to reiterate that this operational plan is the first step in a long-term vision to change the county culture. 
We value your input and ask for patience in terms of seeing any particular feedback materialize in, our, in this first plan. In addition to presenting to various commissions and boards, we will have two additional venues for community engagement. We'll develop focus groups with subject matter experts, which are being scheduled at the end of this month, and the county will host three community open houses in April. The open houses will be held in the north, mid, and south county locations. So in summary, I would appreciate any feedback you have. And of course, you can always email our CEO, CAO, at vision at santacruzcounty.us. That concludes my presentation. And I'm here to answer any questions or take your comments. Thank you for that presentation. Matt, any uh, comments or questions for Mr. Machado? Director yeah. McPherson. As one of the board members here uh, on the Board of Supervisors, I want to just explain how excited we are in the county to have the first strategic plan in, uh, in the county. Uh, it's taken a lot of work, but it's really uh, resulted in a lot of collaboration, as you can see from that modern art scheme up there. Uh, I, and I've been a supervisor going into my seventh year now, I have not ever seen, uh, prior to this as well, and having some association with the county, uh, the collaboration effort, the excitement of people working together to come to common, uh, a resolution to common <coughs> problems, uh, particularly in planning and public works. Uh, <coughs> you can see a, a one-stop station coming in very, very quickly that will help the planning, the public service, uh, transportation aspect of what's going on in the county. So uh, I am really excited about this. Uh, Carlos Palacios, our CAO, is to be congratulated and put it, bringing this one of the first steps he says I want to do is put this together and get us working together and it's uh, literally working out very well so I appreciate that effort with the county and I really do encourage each of us if we have some suggestions let us know because uh, we want to uh, collaborate and get it together so we can do provide these services particularly in transportation here uh, to the most efficient way possible uh, the best services possible Great, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Um, for example, we know that um, the station downtown is an issue that we have in terms of the discussion. Can you sort of walk us through a process that the strategy, if that was identified, how that would work through the system? So, you know, our focus will be to collaborate with, with you. And, it, you know, for the most part, we interact at the road level. And so where we can be a partnership is that when we look at opportunities for transportation improvement, uh, we need to consider the bus system. Now, sometimes, you know, if, if the jurisdictional boundaries aren't the same, if your station is not in the unincorporated area, we won't have the same interaction. But when you run your buses in the system through the unincorporated area, uh, we feel like there's some real opportunities to coordinate, whether it's signal work, whether it's uh, specific bus improvements, whether it's um, the information, the, the technology interaction, uh, or bus stops. And so we see this at the ground level where we can coordinate our efforts with your efforts. And, and it may not apply to all your infrastructure, because some of your infrastructure is not in our jurisdiction. So it'll be a jurisdictional uh, area as well. Thank you. Director Rockman. I just wanted to appreciate the county taking this approach because people's experience of government is kind of like, well, we do this stuff because we've always done this stuff, and this is what we do, and you ask them, well, well why this, or not, not that, or something, and to actually sit down and require that everything you do be put to the test of, we're doing this for this reason, and this is what we expect the outcome to be, it's really going to be helpful, so I, I appreciate that this is the way you approach this. Thank you. Director Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. You know, everything that comes to our Board of Supervisors this day has to align with our strategic plan. You have to, it's part of the, the, the board memo uh, to, to say, are we actually operating the plan? Um, I think the uh, the areas where we would look in the future to working with Metro as we continue to do our work on our sustainable Santa Cruz uh, County plan is what's the role as we look at uh, uh, increases in densities on transit corridors, what's the role of the bus system, um, should there be requirements for things like eco, eco passes, in certain kinds of development. Um, so I think there's a great opportunity to, to, to use that strategic plan uh, to, to work with our partners uh, to make things happen. 
Myers. I would just uh, remark I'm uh, pleased to see the strategy three regarding uh, prioritizing transit oriented development. And uh, I know in the city we will hopefully in our downtown area have a, a variety of uh, opportunities in the coming years to. Um, to really test that theory and hopefully get people living downtown, um, both people who work downtown, but also may need to be going out to the hospital or South County. So um, I'm hoping that we can uh, work together and, and put some of these kinds of things on the ground in the coming years. So great strategy. Thank you. Other comments? All right, Mr. Machado, thank you for that presentation. And I hope that uh, Metro's connectivity line uh, on your chart uh, gets to be a bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> we, love, we love that, uh, so everything you do for us. So great. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to uh, our CEO report. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Director. It's a uh, number of items, so uh, thank your indulgence. Uh, I want to go through several pieces of legislation that are going on right now. Um, AB 1351, uh, introduced by uh, Assemblyman Lackey, uh, imposes some pretty stringent paratransit requirements upon transit properties across the state. Um, we are working through the CTA to help the author understand why those types of changes go well up and beyond what the federal government requires. If that were to pass in its current form, not only is it an unfunded mandate, uh, but it imposes things like a seven-day constraint on certification, which is very difficult for the transit properties across the state to achieve. It could change our current fare structure, um, and we would likely have to add drivers and vehicles. So it's a very costly mandate, and we're working through the CTA, California Transit Association, to help the author understand that. Uh, AB 784 by Mullen is a state sales and use tax exemption for zero emission buses. As you can imagine, we're wholeheartedly in favor of that. That on um, each bus purchase is estimated to result in a savings of about $30,000. So we'll take everything we can get, especially given the fact that a compressed natural gas bus is about $700,000 to $750,000, and a zero emission bus is in the realm of about a million dollars. So there's a big difference there for us to bridge. Um, AB 1568 by McCarty. Local streets and roads dollars tied to housing production targets. Um, obviously, that doesn't necessarily affect us right now, although given the talk at the state by the governor, you never know. Um, but I think for now, we're at least uh, saying that transit should support our cities and counties and, and they're concerned about tying local streets and roads dollars to housing targets. AB 11, CHU or CHOW, uh, allows cities and counties to create affordable housing and infrastructure agency. Uh, not super connected to transit, but we're watching that because that, for example, if um, um, counties were able to reestablish something that looks like a redevelopment agency and cities were able to do that, uh, Pacific Station could potentially be a factor of that uh, in partnership with the city. So that's. That's one that we're monitoring, although there's not a, a direct linkage. Uh, and then SB 50 by uh, Senator Weiner, Planning and Zoning Housing Development Equitable Communities Incentive imposes affordable uh, housing requirements in areas of transit stations and high-frequency bus lines. We are evaluating whether we have any, any lines that have sufficient frequency to qualify under this legislation. Um, I, w I was a little surprised to see the chamber took a position strongly in favor of it. Um, I think we're just relatively neutral on that for right now. Um, but generally speaking, we, on the transit side, try to uh, support cities and their, their right to uh, dictate how they plan their cities and what their land uses are. Uh, and that does have some impositions that sort of usurp some of that city and county right. Um, so we're just sort of neutral on that right now. On the federal side, uh, there's uh, a lot of talk about uh, the FAST Act, and then there's, of course, one more round of funding in FY20 before there has to be a reauthorization. Um, we were quite surprised to see President Trump uh, last week propose $500 million in additional transportation funds. Um, he actually mentioned, I think, the word bus, which he has not done <laughs> before. Uh, $250 million of that would go to bus and bus facilities, and of course we apply for those programs. So we're, we're optimistic. 
um, and we hope he really means it. Um, he certainly meant it. I'm sure he meant it when he said it. I think he <laughs> can count on it. That's what worries me. I just returned also uh, this week from a trip to Washington, D.C., the ACTA Legislative Conference. And as you know, we take board members in April to uh, to Washington, D.C. We detach ourselves from that conference because the conference just overwhelms the hill with people and it's an ineffective time to try to communicate with elected officials. And um, it was somewhat fortuitous too this year because um, they were in recess and nobody was there. So um, what I did was I was able to gather uh, sufficient information to begin to really refine where we will focus our effort when we go um, with the board members in April. And they really fall into sort of three areas. Uh, one, of course, is similar to my discussion about uh, President Trump's proposal. Um, we'd like to see that in FY20, next year's funding cycle, that we are plussed up again. We get more money than the FAST Act is uh, proposing, and the goal there is to get about $702 million more nationwide for the bus and bus facilities program. Uh, in theory, that might be divided between the formula, uh, the money that we would get based on a formula, and the money we would have to compete for. Second area, uh, similar to uh, 2009 with the ARA funding, it's time for another infrastructure package, and we're proposing uh, a $7.42 billion infrastructure package. And that's really based, uh, that, re that number comes out of the bus coalition, by the way, and that's really based on an inventory of properties across, the transit properties across the nation, uh, asking them, what do you need in the way of bus funds to replace your aging fleet? And when you roll all that up, it comes up to about $702 million to start getting caught up on all of that. Um, it is interesting to note that as we dug deeper and deeper into this number, um, that since NAP 21 and, and 2012, um, and, which was a, a reauthorization that uh, severely cut into the bus and bus facilities program, since then um, we, have, we have seen about uh, an 18% drop in ridership nationwide and correlating to that, um, we've seen transit properties reduce their buses by about 18%. We think there's a direct relationship to that. Um, because transit properties are having a difficult time funding not only operations, but their capital expenditures, they're having to pull back on the equipment and go through some of the exercises as you did with the comprehensive operational analysis in which in order to balance the budget, we had to pull in some of our service. That has replicated it across itself <coughs> across the nation, uh, and I think that is part of the story we want to tell, is if we can get the money to replace our buses, um, we can hopefully bring ridership back up and go in the right direction. Uh, and then the third point is the FAST Act reauthorization. Um, baseline asking for at least $13.82 billion in transit funding over six years. Again, looking at the inventory backlog of buses and other facilities, state of good repair that drives that number. Um, we also saw that uh, they won't be able to do that, and the Highway Trust Fund is going to be severely impacted and will go severely negative uh, within a year if they don't do something about stable recurring funding. And what is being proposed, uh, really, both by APTA and the Bus Coalition, is that the federal government uh, look at a 25 cent federal gas tax increase in order to fund the Highway Trust Fund and, and start attacking the backlog of state good repair. And then, of course, in our mix, uh, because we, we receive uh, small transit intensive cities, what we call stick dollars, um, to the tune of about $2.2 million a year, um, we want to see the stick program go from its current 2% level to 3%. Uh, and that'll be part of our, our uh, lobbying effort. <coughs> So those three things is what we'll cover. I think it's very focused. We'll be able to get in and out of the offices and say, this is what we need, please help. Um, Alex? Yes. Could you explain, uh, maybe new board members are not so aware, what the difference between APTA and the Bus Coalition? Sure. Uh, APTA is the, well, they're both nationwide organizations. Uh, APTA is, is a, the trade organization for bus and rail, for transportation as a whole nationwide. Um, which all, sometimes creates some interesting challenges between <coughs> bus competing for rail money and APTA has a hard time finding a place to try to be even keeled about that. The bus coalition is very focused 
um, was organized for really a single purpose in the post-2012 environment with NAP 21, when it took all of the uh, 5339 money down and just made a very small formula allocation, the bus coalition formed and said, look, we, we gotta reverse this. This is a horrible thing that you've done to transit properties. And they worked and they worked and they worked. And, and actually last year, you saw the first sort of fruits of their labor when we got uh, a significant increase in the 5339 program. Uh, so they continue to try to work um, the awareness program on our behalf nationwide with elected officials so that they understand what MAP 21 did to us on the bus side when all that moved, that money incidentally moved from bus to rail um, and what it, what it did to us and what it, what it is causing, how it is devastating our ability to replace buses. And they're trying to not only get the funding level back to where it was in 2012, but they're trying to recoup in the coming years the money that we lost since 2012. Um, so they've been very effective. It's a great organization to belong to. And quite frankly, they are putting out better, uh, more concise information today than I think it is. So I'm very pleased with what they're doing. Uh, HR 1139 is the uh, uh, proposed new legislation, federally, Federal Transit Worker and Pedestrian Safety Act. By its title, it sounds like a really good thing. Uh, it's another unfunded mandate. Uh, it, it has uh, within it the requirement that we would have to look at driver compartment barriers. As you may know, in major urbanized cities, they do have a uh, problem in some cities with assaults on bus operators. Uh, we don't have that problem here. We feel that legislation like this is just too vanilla, too blank approach to just say everybody should do it. We really favor more sorting those kinds of things out at the local level. I don't know about uh, the current smart leadership's position on this. The past position was that our drivers like to interface with the customers. They don't like to have a big old shield built around their driver's compartment. I don't know if that's changed. We'll find that out in the coming days as we interface with the smart leadership on this one. Um, but either way, we think it should be a local decision as opposed to being mandated nationwide. <coughs> the There's a, a requirement for driver-assisted technology. We don't know what that means. We don't know what that costs. It certainly falls into the unfunded mandate category. And, and quite frankly, some of those kinds of technologies that are being experimented with today for pedestrian collision avoidance, um, while a great thought to try to get there, are ineffective and have proven to be um, um, you know, totally useful at this particular point. So that's a developing area. It's premature to say you need to install something that just really doesn't work yet. Uh, and then other risk reduction kinds of things that we have to do, and we have to do a report annually and then provide it to the secretary of the DOT every three years. Um, it's, it's a legislation that needs to be worked with and sort of remolded. Um, and then the U.S. Census, as you know, is getting ready to gear up or is in the process of gearing up. And you might initially think, as I did, well, there, why would we be interested in Metro in the U.S. Census? And actually, we have a really big interest in it. We'll need to stay involved in that process and help out however we can. Um, we ran a quick number. Uh, Wanda Moo, who works for Barrow, ran a, a quick number. What if the population in Santa Cruz County were undercounted by 5%, just 5%? That, that would result in a loss of about $400,000 in 5307 money to us. We have an interest in the census being done right. Uh, but there's other things to watch out for. Uh, Ten years ago, there was an attempt to merge the Salinas, San Benito, Monterey and Santa Cruz County into one big urbanized area. Um, and uh, thanks to Congressman Farr, um, we were able to beat that back and leave the urbanized areas distinctions as they were. Why is that important? Well, it's really important to us because within Santa Cruz County, we have two urbanized areas. And those two urbanized areas benefit us in a couple of ways. By having two urbanized areas, the 265,000 population is split across two urbanized areas. And that allows us to, to, uh, to receive what we call, you know, again, the stick money, the small transit intensive cities for both urbanized areas. If we were merged into that one larger group, we would lose all of that. That would be about a $2.2 million loss to our budget. But in addition to that, um, on the 5307 side, because we are, because our urbanized areas are under 200,000, we are allowed to use 100% of the 5307, about $5 million, 100% of that 
in our operating fund, and we do use 100% of it in our operating fund. If we go to the over the 200,000 category through that big old merger, then you can only use 20% of that in the operating fund. Um, so that's a massive loss of in excess of $3 million in the operating fund. You don't lose the money, you just have to dedicate it to capital. But it puts up three million dollars. That we have to win to drive them. <laughs> there you go. Three million. So altogether, that kind of a concept, if it were to come back again, and if it were to prevail, would cost us in the operating fund over a five million dollar loss. We just cannot sustain that. Uh, and then finally, just moving on to uh, our new hires and our promotions, we have uh, Jennifer Courtright, <coughs> a paratransit operator. Anthony Frey, or Frey, a paratransit operator. Juan Serrano, paratransit. Um, Matt Marquez, as you approved last month, uh, provisional and planning aid. Uh, Corey Espinoza, bus operator, and Mario Rodriguez, bus operator. And then Antonio Garcia promoted from DSW-1 to a bus operator. And Mr. Chair and Directors, that concludes my remarks, and I have to answer your questions. Sure. Any questions for the CEO? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the county and well, I'm pretty sure the cities must be involved with the two is has a complete count committee uh, that's working on issues to ensure that we get complete count and I can have them reach out to you to to figure out what role Metro might be able to play um, in our efforts to make sure that everyone gets counted yes that would be great and I'm not sure if that's the same one Barrow sent one to move the one this week um, it is so Previous census, there was a really intense year-long effort headed by United Way, as well funded with outreach, and um, I know the same dollars are there. Who's heading this? Uh, Nicole Coburn, who's our uh, oh, okay. uh, assistant CAO. Yeah. Um, it's it's through my mind, apparently. <laughs> but uh, the city, I mean, we should all just be putting some resources to that. So yeah, it's critical. I'll make sure we get connected with that. Any other questions or comments? I can just see making sure that we get some ads on these buses about the census because we're going to have that ridership that needs to be represented, and I think that would be a really good message that goes throughout the county if we can incorporate it, and maybe get a little bit of marketing money um, out there for it. But, but to that point, if there's a heat count, they must have a logo or message that's um, right. one that repeated them. Right. Certainly, what I was thinking is maybe we, whatever that logo is, to be yeah, able to it. get it, use it, mm -hmm. and um, I mean, we need some on those buses, and I think that would be a good start for us to start showing what's promoted that's uniform and uh, attract the attention of those that are writers that could be missed. Any other comments? <clears throat> I just want to bring up one thing. <clears throat> I was fortunate enough on Wednesday to attend the uh, Central Coast, with, along with the Central Coast Coalition and the Executive Director of the RTC. Uh, we went up there and tried to do some lobbying for uh, for, uh, for the RTC, and we were fortunate to have a meeting with the governor and uh, brought up the question about Seneca One, which you alluded to about this interpretation. He talked about uh, tying transportation money to housing, which was a big concern for this group. And uh, I'm happy to say that the governor kind of walked that back and is now saying that the, the intent is not to take the money away. The intent is, uh, how we put it, <clears throat> a lot of it fell under what the, uh, the cities and counties do in their arena numbers. And what he really wanted to stress was not going to make the money contingent. He just was trying to, it, it was important for all cities and counties to make sure that they submitted their paperwork. And uh, uh, Mara Tunney was from there from, there from Ambay. And it informed that there were a lot of cities that, in, in four in our district here, that had not submitted their paperwork. So, uh, what the governor's saying is, you know, what they really want us to do is they just want you to not have anything that's going to prevent you from doing housing or not enact ordinances that, that make housing difficult. But uh, I think the only city that they actually did send a letter to about withholding money was Huntington Beach, was the one that, that they, they, they talked to. Because yeah. they just said, we have want nothing to do with this program whatsoever. So I, I think we left the, the body, which was really concerned about transportation, left the room feeling like, uh, you know, they acknowledged the SB1 money was ours after all the battles we went through to get it. And we could, out of his mouth, he said we could relax. So, uh, you know, we're going to take that as a, as a good sign. So. Yes, they've only sued Huntington Beach, but there are 11 other 
uh, jurisdictions that they're that they put on their watch list. Right. We're not in that list. No, we're not. So. And, and like I said, it, it, a lot of it was just paperwork. And, and Mara herself said that you know that the four cities in, in our area that did not, she's helping them complete their paperwork. Good news. All right. So that's uh, let's move on to uh, approval of the fiscal year 20 and 21 preliminary operating budget. And for that, uh, Angela, welcome. Good morning. So this is a uh, staff report that I <coughs> normally show to the finance committee and do a presentation at, and then it comes to the full board on consent. Um, I'm going to leave it to your choice if you'd like me to go through the, the quick presentation that I did to the finance committee, or if you just want me to talk. I think the quick presentation would be sufficient. We can do that. All right, so this is the preliminary operating budget for FY2021 and the preliminary capital budget for FY20. We did a two-year rolling operating budget and a one-year capital budget. The reason it in preliminaries in red is because this is the uh, very, very, very draft um, of our budget. We'll be coming back with the draft budget in May. Um, we put a lot of information together between now and the uh, uh, finance committee beginning in May as to what we're going to be doing for. The reason we put this together, we get money from RTC, so we have to um, put for a submission to RTC asking for that money. As I said, this is for today's operating budget 2021, revenue operating transfers, and then only uh, one year for capital budget. So on the revenue side of our operating budget, or our two-year rolling budget, we have approximately $54 million in our 19 budget right now. We are um, going forward in budget 56 and 58 in the corresponding years of 20 and 21. On the right-hand side, it also mirrors the left-hand side, which is in a different graphing format. Almost 50% of our revenue is from sales tax, and that includes the sales tax that we had in the 70s and the uh, measured e sales tax. On the operating expense side, we have about $50 million this year, going up to about 52, and almost 53 in FY21. Uh, the graph on the right hand side again, the majority of it, because we are a service industry, is our labor and fringe. Only 17% of this is our non personal expenses, which is our fuel and parts and things like that. That's our operating budget. Transferring out of the operating budget, we are projecting in this current year to be about 3.7, next year about 5 million. And then in 21, about 5.3 million, we're able to take out the operating budget and put it into the reserve funds that we have over there. One of the mandates that the board is um, put forward is that they want to put about $3 million every year into a fund so that we can start getting rid of the 62 uh, buses that we still have to replace. So I'm not sure if that number's down to yet, but I know 62 is still our number. On to the capital budget. These are the um, projects that we are going to be working on in the coming fiscal year 20. As you can see, we have seven, over $17 million worth of money put into our fleet. That means the revenue uh, buses, the paracruise vans, the uh, non-revenue vehicles, meaning the uh, small run-along cars that you see some of the operators in, and uh, admin staff. And then the next largest one is construction-related projects that we have going on. The funding for those projects that we want to do, the majority of it is coming from federal grants. And we have PTM ISDA for about two, almost $3 million, that's the 1B money. STA, and then our uh, transfers from the operating budget for Measure D. That's it. I'll go into more detail in May. Great, I, I have a question. Uh, just representing Capitola and maybe Scotts Valley and lots of the other, any plans to uh, add any drivers or new routes? Mr. Chair, directors, um, so this budget has uh, one driver in it for the uh, Watsonville circulator. You, you might recall that uh, we have, um, uh, we're, we're ordering four electric buses. One of those was funded through the LC Top program and that bus is expected to be here in the first quarter of next calendar year, which would be this next budget's fiscal year. So that bus operator is funded in this budget for the uh, Watsonville Circulator. Um, and its first year funding is through AB 2766 grant. So it doesn't, the first year, it doesn't impact us 
um, directly, more indirectly. Then, um, in addition to that, we originally had a bus operator program for expansion in this year's budget, but we discovered after a further evaluation that we're one of the reasons why we just can't seem to get up to speed and fill all of our bus operator positions is that we can't get them pushed through the training program. Um, so we came to you uh, recently in the last month or so and asked you if we could reprogram that bus operator into the training and add a, a, an assistant training, um, an assistant trainer, so that we can push more people through the program and get caught up. In other words, what that means is there, you could add all the expansion operators you want, but you wouldn't get what you want because we couldn't get them trained. So we, we came up with that strategic uh, initiative. We think that will help us dramatically. Um, beyond that, I just want to turn, if I could, Farrell real quick to talk about what he had presented to you uh, previously about what we're thinking in that area. Thank you, Chair, board members, staff, and public. Real quickly. You'll remember the last couple of years following the COA, I gave an annual report on the status of service planning in August. And in last year's report, we identified our three priorities for service growth, if and when we could ever have it. Reminder, the first one was the position that Alex just referred to that was traded in, if you'll allow that expression, for the trainer. That had been identified a year or so ago to an enhance Route 35 service up the two legs in the valley because in the evenings our frequency there is two to three hours between buses. That was just one of those cuts from the COA. We knew we wanted to get back to cleaning that up to a decent level of frequency. Our second priority we told you about last year was the Watsonville Circulator. And our third priority was improvements to Route 66 and or 68 through Live Oak, the services that run from Capitola Mall to downtown Santa Cruz. And we have two issues there. In the evenings, one or both of them on weekdays and weekends start stop service so early. You hear me always back during the COA was either frequency or span of service. A really bad span of service situation there because not everybody's day is 8 to 5. It's people's days are going in the evening. And we'd like to think, as we were reminded by Jared Walker, that that section of this community probably has the most transit-oriented demographics density, work patterns, age group, incomes, et cetera. And we'd also like to, when the time is available financially, we'd like to work on improving the daytime frequency. So that's about as deep as we went in our priorities. Uh, what I do want to say is, when I see you next month, just one other thing I wanted to add, is that I look forward to sharing more about the big picture of our service level shortcomings relative to our service standards. We've, have cert we've had service standards for years. We don't relate to them a lot, but the COA, there were places we achieved our service standards until then. Now we don't. And I'd like to address that topic when I come back with our strategic plan final item next month. Great. Yeah. Well, I, uh, uh, I appreciate the priorities uh, setting, and I just want to point out that the county has approved uh, or is in process of uh, consideration of some major um, a development in the mid-county, we have approved a 57-unit uh, affordable housing complex on Capitola Road that it's going to include a 20,000-square-foot health center and a 10,000-square-foot dental clinic. That's going to be heavily used not only by people in Live Oak but throughout the county. Um, we are contemplating a, a major a medical facility on Soquel Avenue. Um, and uh, we just had a presentation about a major new project on 7th and Bromer that would have 48 units of housing and lots of visitor uh, serving uh, facilities. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be important for us uh, in, that, in that third priority to, to match up with what's going to be going on. Those, uh, I think two of those projects could be uh, under development as early as 2020. I know that the housing is going to be, uh, 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 assuming the environmental work is complete, it, it will be done. Um, it will be ready to, for construction. Um, the hospital, or the, not the hospital, the medical facility is looking to, to be under construction in 2020 as well. I'm not sure if they'll, they'll make it or whether that's going to be 2021 and then 7th and Brome are roughly around the same time. So I, I just think we have to be prepared uh, for those changes in development patterns in the mid-county. good thing is we'll have some time to plan for that, so that's good. Questions? Director Coffin, go Thank you. 
Um, I, I see that you have 7% of your fringe and retirees. Can you tell me what the trend looks like on that? Um, from where we've been to where can we expect that to be going as a result of what's going on with CalPERS? So the trend with our retirees, as you know, we have big loans for the that the baby boomers and more of them are retiring. Um, it's going to grow. How much, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but we know it's going to grow. Can we look into that a little bit more so I have a better idea of you know, figures financially? Because 7% of the overall budget that isn't going to be utilized for the services because of, you know, we, we know that we're, the benefits go to retirees and, and whatnot there, but as that number grows, it also shrinks in what we can do with capital and other projects. I just want to really make sure that that's um, something the public is aware of, that even though we're bringing in as much money as we can, that's that's a big significant number that we're it's going out and not going into the services. So we did a presentation to the finance committee a couple months ago, I think it was. So I came forward that presentation to you, and then we also have some more stuff that we're putting together. Thanks. We have some uh, analysis we can forward to you that looks at low case, medium case, high case on estimation of retiring medical. So we can send that to you. So wanted to point you to sixteen point four. In your packet, it does tell you all the FTEs that we're putting in and taking out. And the one in particular that you were talking about, the bus operator expansion, 0.5 to 0 and 20. If you come down to assistant safety and training coordinator, it's 0, 20 to 1, funded in FY20. So that's this question. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Jeff Matthews, you have a question? Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the whole um, unfunded mandates for pension would be good to include in the, in the uh, financial in the budget discussion. It's out there, and I'm sure you have a multi-year projection on that. Assumption. We had discussion of that at the yeah. Finance Committee yeah. at some great detail. Yeah. That was the, when he's asked the question at the beginning, exactly. do you want that all today, or do you want no, he said not today, but exactly. we do have but it. But it will be part of the right. upcoming discussion. And then I just had a few questions in terms of um, operating revenues. You're projecting um, increases in fares uh, while the ridership decreases and comment on that. So passenger fares we're basing out on twenty nineteen projections. Right now we're looking at about two point six million dollars. <coughs> a two percent decrease on passenger fares. But we have trust transit special transit fares which have a two and a half percent increase. So we're pretty level. And the special the transit fares are UCSC contract. Okay, the green contract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, just some uh, questions about um, projected increases in advertising. Mm -hmm. We uh, actually got McDonald's back, so they're pretty big advertising. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, well, we're it, loving it. Although it is 2,000 calories of artery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 What, what do you think from a retiree? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, director. Just one other point yeah. on that. As you know, we're in the process of hiring a, a marketing yeah. director, yeah. and, and so we're hoping that person will put some emphasis in growing that program. Just to remind the board, um, our advertising program is in the mode of: if you call us, we'll be happy to take your money and put your advertising on our bus. We need to flip the model and do some proactive. Um, outreach to try to grow our, our advertising. And I know that marketing director position's been hanging out there for a while. Is there progress on that? Uh, good progress, a good application pool. I think it's this Monday we start interviewing. Oh, great. Okay. I think that's, uh, oh, and then the, the, there's some discussion of rent income, and um, I don't think we have on uh, how much of that is so the rent income is from our Pacific Station and our only position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we don't have anybody in Scotts Valley right now, but we can have tenants in Scotts Valley, I mean in Watsonville and in mm -hmm. on Pacific Station. Okay. And there was someone close for Scotts Valley, it just didn't work out. I mean, so that's in yes. in the works getting someone there, rent income. Did did materialize I, I think Angela, are you talking to somebody who was interested in or did that I have two more people that have called me and emailed me and want information, so I'm, it's, it's again, if you, I signs out there, but if you call us, that's when I get involved in it. I, mm -hmm. I just knew there's been discussion, so hopefully something will come 
Director Mathis, you uh, completed? Yeah. Okay, Director Myers. I just had a question about the uh, on operating revenues, the AMBAG grant funding. Is that a one time or is that continuing? So, AMBAG um, grants in general, we uh, tend to not budget for grants until they've been awarded uh, because it is so. Mm -hmm. I know, up. yeah. And so, we don't want to put that in our budget and rely on it for something that we're going to do. But uh, we, we do get grants, and when they come in, then the corresponding expenses that are incurred against those grants, it's kind of a in and out. Okay. Okay. Great. So that is a one time then That's specific to that grant. Lots of bills circular. Lots of bills circular. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. And just uh, as as was mentioned on some of the planning, I know that there's been requests from the uh, Enterprise Borland Center in Scotts Valley with uh, with UCSC up there now and another larger company. Um, and the housing and things, and I know that that's one of the uh, areas that, that is under consideration for when we can add uh, the route back up that direction a little closer, and I know I appreciate that that's been in discussion and, and something that we're hoping to plan for also. So. Sounds good. Other questions? All right, I'd like to open up to the public. Any from the public like to uh, ask questions about the preliminary budget? Seeing that, I'll bring it back for a discussion and a motion. Any discussion? Move to approve by Rockin. Second. Second by Lynn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Takes us to uh, authorization of the provisional administrative specialist position in the purchasing department. Eric. Good morning. Donna or uh, Jordan? Do you think you could bring up the, the second to last slide of the previous presentation, the capital pie chart? I think that's a good follow-up for this item. <laughs> uh, I'll get started though. So um, this item uh, is for an, a provisional administrative specialist position within the purchasing department. And uh, what this is for is really project, capital project administration. So. There, there's actually a typo in my staff report. I say $2.2 million of capital projects. It's $22 million. There's, there's no period in there. So, yeah, you know, a little bit of a difference. So we have $22 million in capital projects, um, which equates to about 40 projects. Um, and they are, uh, uh, this is federal money, this is state money, and they each have their own uh, rules and administrative requirements. So it's a lot of work and um, a lot of these are in the facilities maintenance department and facilities maintenance has one administrative position, fleet has one administrative position, purchasing has one administrative position. So a lot is falling on these folks. So to um, administrate these capital projects, which can take years. This isn't fiscal year. This is um, going back to 2014 right now. We're trying to close out a grant. So you're looking at you know multiple years of project administration and management here. So it's, it, it's complex. Um, so what I did, um, I'm the purchasing and special projects director. So I've been with Metro about 15 years doing procurement and then project management. So um, a lot happens in my department and we have a lot of uh, information, we have a lot of uh, administration that goes on in, in pur purchasing and um, uh, grants also takes on a lot of the burden of doing these administrative tasks. Um, as well as just getting the work done, actually trying to move the projects forward. Um, so what I did was I uh, brought in a temp employee and I downloaded everything I knew about Metro and how we do business, our grants, our procurement, our project management, and um, kind of handed everything off to that person. Um, and uh, that's been going really well. So. Um, Right now, it's a lot of communication. I detailed some of the tasks that they do in the staff report. Um, single point of contact for all the working groups. A lot of these capital projects touch multiple departments. So you've got to communicate within the departments. 
Um, you, uh, we also report out to the board of directors in the monthly finance uh, documents. We report to the CEO monthly status, that kind of thing. Um, so this employee has been doing a lot of administrative work, a lot of communication. Um, but one thing that um, Alex, the CEO, would like is a little bit more of a hands-on approach at really moving these projects along and, and keeping them going. So that's one thing that we're, um, that we're working on. And that's going to be something like oversight of um, budget, oversight of schedule management. Um, a lot of these grants have very specific milestones where you have to have your procurement done, you have to be in contract, you have to have issued a notice to proceed um, within the first six months of, of some of these. So it's, it's, it's pretty tight. And you can lose your funding if you don't meet these milestones. And um, unfortunately, over the last few years, we, we have come up against that milestone um, too often, I'm sure, for Alex's taste, where um, that funding can be at risk just because we haven't spent it. So it's kind of a nice place to be. Um, but uh, uh, the departments need help, facilities, um, fleet purchasing grants, um, finance, you know, a lot of the burden also falls on finance. They do a lot of the, the budget work and um, uh, reporting with the grants. So um, the plan is that, oh, let me get back to the temp employees. So temp employees can only work 999 hours um, before they um, reach a, a max limit, basically. And they, there are some state rules about what happens with those employees. Um, so instead of letting that employee go, uh, we'd like to bring them on as a provisional um, admin specialist while we develop, further develop this project coordinator position and, and get a job description to you, get a wage study done, um, all that stuff. <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll bring that back to the capital committee and to the, to the board as well, um, very shortly. How long can a person be in a provisional position before you have to? Provisional is a, a minimum of six months. So you commit six months to them and they can um, go to two years. <coughs> so we, we don't want to go that long. Obviously, a provisional employee has all the benefits and, and rights that a, a permanent employee does, but they have that limit. Um, give, thank you for the presentation. Sure. Uh, given the uh, capital projects are are uh, never seem to be as discreet as you hope, <laughs> and they take a, a long time. Is six months realistic, or is this really, uh, do we really need to be thinking about this for a longer term position? Okay, interject myself into that Go ahead. discussion. So, <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, I, think, I think I would answer it this way. I need a minimum of six months to figure it out. Uh, I hope it won't go two years. Aaron and I are continuously sort of remolding the function that, that Jason's performing for us and trying to find the right mix. And we need to prove that out before I come to you and say, I need a permanent position. This is a really big issue. Um, um, and, and I'm concerned about it. I, I don't like seeing a slide that says we have $22 million <coughs> worth of projects there. Uh, I mean, it's kind of nice in some ways, but when you look at how slow we're spending that down, that's the problem. And I really worry that as we go to DC and we say, we need more money and we want you to support our grants, the folks in Washington at the FTA open up the file and they look at Metro and they say, well, we awarded you all these grants and look, your spending is terrible. You're just not spending the money down. And so why would we award you another grant if you can't spend the ones you already have? That's a very real concern. So we need to move these projects along and we've had too many projects recently that have come up against the deadline and we're in risk of losing money. And I have a basic rule with my staff is we never give any money back here, never. <laughs> so you can't do that. And you can't constantly be in this fire drill mode of, of channeling everybody together to try to get a project out the door and not lose the money. You just can't do that, it's very disruptive. So we have to figure out a way and we haven't quite figured it out yet. We, we have this breadth of projects, 22 million, and you know, is the right mix to say this person should work on all of those some way, shape, or form? Maybe not. It may be that we have to pick some of the oldest ones, or it could be a, a handful of the highest priority, which could be the oldest ones. 
and, and have the person in this position focus on moving those forward. So all that is to say, we don't know yet, but we know we need some help, and we'll have an answer for you when we come back, if and when we ask for permanent positions. Sure, I mean, I just think that 22 million, uh, we, won't, we won't have the pleasure of spending 22 million in six months, and so, uh, you know, what happens after that? I look forward to the report at that point. Absolutely. Director Matthews. Yeah, um, just some questions I can see. There's a huge amount of demand <coughs> and limited staff. Um, and it appears also, I, I know nothing of the details, but it appears as though the job description is evolving. Yes. And so um, it could well be that the person currently doing this has, has um, become very useful on a temporary basis. We want to uh, continue that person, but it may also happen that as the job description evolves with a, a huge range of uh, responsibility from um, admin support basically to major capital projects that um, different needs evolve. Yes. So um, when do you see that coming back to us and have you also considered um, contracting for project management on some other big things that would not require an internal person. Yes, uh, so Aaron and I have talked about that. So so minimal six months to bring it back to you. If we can figure this out and, and make it work and get that job description right and be able to prove to you that it worked, we'll bring it back to you as soon as we, we can, but no sooner than six months. Um, we absolutely will, on every project that we have, look at the magnitude and size of that project and what I've committed to my staff is we will budget within that project, contracted project management, mm -hmm. if it crosses over a certain, mm -hmm. certain threshold. For example, uh, the Judy K. Sousa building is, mm -hmm. a, is an obvious one, right? So as you start coming down to smaller, smaller projects where you get that threshold, we have to evaluate each and every project case by case. The, the other point that I neglected to mention is now under this new philosophy, every grant that we apply for, if it allows project management, mm -hmm. we're going to put project management in that grant. Um, so the, the beauty of that is that we can shift project management, whether that be our internal project management or contract project management, into capital and out of operating. Mm -hmm. So where currently, it it's, it's exactly where it should be. And so, so the project manager should project their time to a capital project mm -hmm. instead of the operating mm -hmm. fund and help reduce the dependency on the operating fund. So that's the ultimate goal. But we haven't done that in the past, and, and Wandamu has been directed to always look for the opportunity in each and every grant to put project management in there. If I can add to that a little bit, um, what we're finding in a lot of these grants is that it's not an eligible expense. So um, any, kind, any kind of upfront planning, design, uh, a lot of the studies that we need to do before we uh, going to say a construction project, they're not eligible expenses. So staff is having to um, do the work in-house or we're paying consultants out of our operating budget. So we, you're, you're right, we don't particularly want to do that whenever there's an opportunity. But that is one reason to have a good in-house coordinator, some sort of administrative support because um, you know often like the uh, uh, FTA 5339A grant that we get um, we get about a half a million dollars that splinters into about 15 to 20 projects sometimes. You've seen the list lately. Um, that you, you can't do uh, any design, any project management, construction support services, anything like that. It's just construction <coughs> contractor. So it's difficult, but yes, absolutely, as we can find the opportunity, we will. Director Roswell. I'm a little unclear why we are taking this permanent position thinking about it, I mean, I heard you say permanent in passing. <coughs> um, I assume that the person you're having in the temp position, you're happy with. Absolutely. Yeah. But then you're going to make it a provisional for six months, and you have a person that you're happy with, and that person may in fact be thinking, this is an unstable job, so I may be looking for a more stable job, because we're not going to make this a permanent position. So I'm a little unclear why we're still messing around with this and not having this as a permanent position since we have $22 million of money to actually finish project. Yeah, I, I, I can't argue with the logic you just conveyed. I, I think the approach we've taken is the approach of trying to figure out 
what it is that this new position is going to be and what it's going to do before we make it a permanent position. There absolutely is risk that we could lose the individual, but there's also incentive for the individual to really work with us and help make this a success so that we can get back to you as soon as possible with a permanent position. We can't guarantee him to date the job because we have to follow through a right. normal HR process of recruiting, um, but you know, as things go, that person gains a lot of experience, can do really well in the interview process, but we have to have an open, inclusive process. And, and I don't intend to wait the six months. It's not like we're not going to do anything. Yeah, um, we're going to work very hard on the job description, get a wage study together. You know, Alex has been working um, very closely with us on this. So we're hoping to bring something back. And um, the, the board usually doesn't meet in July. Um, so we're going to try to bring something either June or, or August and get ahead of it. So we're, we're not just going to wait six months. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, there's a little follow-up. My main uh, point was that the job description appears to be evolving. We want to make sure that, that those things sync up with our future needs. Um, and then I noticed there was, in our budget, there was no money for temp help. And, um, There'll be a question so the way that we pay for temp help is through um, the overall uh, fringe and benefits. So if there's a savings, which you do see in the budget as well, um, vacant positions, um, leaves, that kind of thing, um, that's the money that we use to pay for tents. We don't uh, budget them ahead of time. Typically we don't have just a tent position. It's usually backfilling a vacancy from someone leaving. So. And then this position is not in the new positions that we've talked about. Correct. So we haven't authorized it yet. Yeah. Right. So, we'll the administrative the specialist is just a, a sort of a placeholder. Yeah. It's the highest level admin yeah. with the most uh, broad duties at this time. Any other questions? I'll go ahead and open it up to the public. Anyone from the public like to weigh in on this topic? Seeing none, bring it back to the board. I move for the authorized provisional administrative specialist for a period of up to six months in the courtesy department. But also, part of the motion, communicate our desire that this happen a lot quicker than six months. <laughs> motion by Rodkins, Commander Rodriguez. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. All right, next is a consideration of authorizing the CEO to enter into an agreement with the Coastal Landscaping. Sure. Good morning, Chair Directors, <coughs> Sarah Gary, Chief Operations Officer. Uh, I'm before you here to try to spend some of this money that we have. Um, <laughs> basically what we've got here is, uh, for many, many years now, we have uh, pretty much neglected our landscaping and repairs to our facilities, specifically Vernon and the Cabal Hour Transit Center over in Scotts Valley. Uh, we'd like to change that. We have a little bit of an opportunity to utilize uh, some overrun, some underrun funds to apply and overrun our current uh, landscape budget. What we want to do is spend the money, get these items repaired, and then come back to the board at a later time to ask for additional uh, contract authority with some of the uh, savings that we've experienced throughout this fiscal year. So what uh, the intent is basically to begin doing some of the repairs that have caused some deterioration and possible damage. And we don't want to get it out, continue any further than it's already been. And we want to be able to uh, reestablish uh, all of our landscaping to a level that will mirror that of the Watsonville Transit Center, which uh, appears to be very successful well received by the community and our writers. So as you can see, the Vernon facility is going to consist of some grading, removal, installation of uh, upper parking, retaining walls, installation of those retaining walls, with much more durable products, not so much wood, but rather uh, stone or concrete, and installation of drip irrigation systems throughout, and the planting of some uh, low maintenance 
pyrethra plants and some tristinia trees, which hopefully will not uh, will root down deep so that uh, it doesn't cause any sidewalk and or some damage. So we apply to both the burn facility and the Cavallaro. The drawing that Cavallaro has pretty much explains we took out about 30 trees. We're going to be replanting 20 of them um, based on this particular project that we have. Some areas other than that, uh, there's some dirt, exposed dirt here at the burning facility that every time it rains, it washes onto the sidewalk. It causes some uh, uh, path travel impediments, so we want to try to correct that and uh, pretty much bring our systems back up to speed now that we're pretty much uh, out of the drought and have a little bit of residual rains. We'd like to apply them to this, these two projects. Great, thanks, Sarah. Any questions? Director Colin Um I'd like to know, uh, we do a lot of studies with the, the greenhouse gas emission and the reduction of the carbon footprint that we have here and our goals. Um, how do we relate this into what our goals are that we're doing that are being identified on the local jurisdictions? Because, I mean, it, this may $88,000 and sort of put, putting it over time, it's, it's doing something. And I just want to make sure that it gets captured in the measurement of what our county is doing overall with the reduction of that. And has there been any conversation about, you know, giving this credit for where it's due on that reduction? Well, from the conversations that uh, have taken place is that uh, we're complying with certain requirements, not only from a, a green standpoint, but also from a federal standpoint, because our facilities fall under what is called the Transit Asset Management Program. And uh, much of what we are attempting to do here is to bring the facility up to a level in which, uh, I guess you could say, the clock starts ticking over again. They, they look at it as an improvement and they say, okay, uh, we're starting the clock over. It has a durable lifespan of X, right, whatever that stat is established that is being done by the facilities department. And as a result, uh, the federal government sees it as uh, good maintenance being performed to assets that they have helped us pay for. Yeah, as long as we get credit for it, I mean, I think that's what it's about. We're really, I think all of us have focused really well um, throughout this county on that reduction and I mean, this in itself with you know, putting in the green that we need to here and um, doing our part of that maintenance, um, we should still make sure that we get you know, something counted on that. <laughs> I'm sorry, just a quick comment on that. Um, so, Scotts Valley, uh, we had a lot of trees that we removed that were just absolutely damaging the property. We had to do sidewalk and curb repair. So we're replacing most of those. So that's going to be kind of a wash in that case. The city um, asked us to make sure that we get those replaced. Um, the property here is going to have mostly plants. I think we've installed the trees we're going to install for the most part. Um, but there is some block walls and whatnot that are in that that the price tag that are fairly costly. It's probably somewhat overwashed because we removed so many trees at Scotts Valley. Director Matthews. Um, I'm all for this. I think facilities should be well maintained and it definitely falls into asset management dealing with deferred maintenance. A um, couple of points. Um, very often, um, I, find, I don't know, public properties um, often will do a, uh, a really attractive landscape job and dump a bunch of chips on it and then they forget it and it goes downhill. And so my question is what is there in the way of, it doesn't have to be lavish, but just some kind of management. Because I really do think facilities <coughs> should look good and they should function well and they should look good. It's I think part of the, the goal here. So I assume that plants have been chosen to be drought resistant. We're going for drip irrigation. That's a, a environmentally sound direction. Um, but I would just be interested in um, on how we're planning for ongoing maintenance. So it's not a one-time deal. <laughs> yes, I, I agree, a thousand percent. Um, so how do we get here? Well, we got here well, I know how we got a here. little at a time, right? There was a drought. And, and there was a lot of neglect and things just fell into disrepair. Uh, and now we're in a better place and we want to go from 
you know, sprinkler heads to drip systems and be more water efficient, but it's good, there's a cost to restoring that. So how do we keep it that way once we do it? Well, what, what we do is, uh, ever, ever since I've been here, we have a twice a year walkthrough of every facility that we own. So twice a year, I and Ciro and Eddie and Freddie and others walk through virtually every inch of every facility we have and we take note of everything that falls into the disrepair or it looks like it's headed that direction and it goes on a list to be handled and to, to work towards keeping it up. So I think going forward, as long as we continue doing that, if we see anything degrading, sprinklers falling into disrepair, plants falling into disrepair, we'll catch it. There won't be any more than a six months lag and we'll catch it and we'll get it resolved. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just thinking stuff like weeding. I mean, you go like, I won't name, but some properties. If, if I can clarify that, um, we are tapping into a budget that is provided for landscaping maintenance. maintenance. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, we're, while we're going to expend it prematurely, um, it, we're going to refund it at a later date with the um, cost savings that, we, that we've experienced. That being said, this is a, a kind of a, a weekly, ongoing, monthly type of expenditure that we have in order to maintain the facilities. So it's not like it's not like we're going to do this once and then let it just sit there mm -hmm. and deteriorate. The the landscape contract that we have. So we have a contract with the yes. external. Yes, with uh, yeah. Coastal Landscaping yeah. Incorporated. Yes. So that's ongoing. That's ongoing. Yeah. Okay. I think that answers your concern. Yeah. yeah. And, and just a quick on the sets. I know part of the delay is uh, the trees were, the roots were coming up with a sidewalk and, and causing some safety issues. But then there were some, uh, the city was doing some things and there was some concern from the community about what would be replaced. And um, it, you know, sadly that process took longer because they trying to coordinate with the city on what plants they were replacing just down the street. and what we want to do with Metro and, and uh, some of that slowed down. And the good thing we have uh, the recycled water system there, so um, that is nice to have whatever is there is all covered under our city's recycled water program. But, um, we're still talking about the city suggested, our residents suggested a certain type of tree and Metro would like to see a, a small juniper type, you know, and so there's been some delay of our part from the city's standpoint, so. And coordinating to try to, to learn from what works in other areas. Any other questions? All right, anyone from the public like to weigh in on this topic? Seeing none, bring it back. I move approval of the action. Director uh, Leopold, a uh, motion second by Kaufman Gomez. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. <coughs> Okay, um, item 19 is a, a dec consider a declaration of emergency and authorization of services for ServPro. Um, Zero again. Yes, uh, this particular project um, developed <laughs> due to the, um, uh, the compromising uh, areas there at Pacific Station that allowed uh, the intrusion of water during this rainy season. As a result, uh, we solicited uh, CERPRO to come in and review uh, our leakage areas and determine what was, where the leaks were coming from and what we could do to deal with it. Uh, during that process, they identified the, uh, some conditions that existed that, one, there was a clear understanding that there was a breach in the wall causing some contamination to be uh, noted there. and they were not sure about the other walls. There's three areas. There's a Northwest restroom in the um, employee lounge, and an administrative uh, office area up in the second level, and the information booth down below uh, in the lobby. Those three areas uh, sustained some damage based on the, on the leakage that we have in the water intrusion. When uh, CERPRO came out and identified that there was this leakage and they were uh, attempting to identify where the leakage was coming from, they noted that there was a breach in the wall in the bathroom of the Northwest uh, Lounge. 
that breach allowed them to visually see that there was some contamination of some sort. Uh, we immediately closed the restroom down and had them contract with a company called Proterra. They came out and did sampling of the walls, sampling of the breached wall, things of that nature. It was determined and reported back to Metro that there was some uh, elevated uh, score levels in that bathroom. Uh, that was closed, uh, rendered uh, unusable, and we proceeded to uh, concern ourselves with trying to mitigate the situation for the restroom and the other areas that were identified as having some uh, water intrusion. Uh, as a result, the, um, the walls, they contained the walls, they contained the walls in the restroom, they contained the walls in the administrative office. Uh, in discussions with the company, they said that yes, there were some elevated aspects to the score levels, but that they were not detrimental uh, to a severe case. We just took the extra measure of responding that, uh, in order to try to mitigate this situation further. Because we were unable, because we wanted to have this done quickly, we did not go through a, uh, a request for proposal or a bid process. And as a result, we're coming to the board asking that we uh, pretty much go along and have this have a sole source and authorize our CEO to enter into the contract and pay for the services that have been rendered. As we speak now, I'm having a container brought over to the um, Pacific Station so that the remaining portion of the, the information needs to be dismantled to see what, what is going to be, what the damage is that's inside there. I need to move all the employees over that container and have the services provided from that container. Okay. Any questions? Matthews. A whole lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> we'll open up Pandora's box here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> um, so, um, were they able to determine where the leak was from? <clears throat> the majority of the leaks are all coming from the windows. Um, two areas facing Pacific Avenue and the curved windows above the, um, the information as currently known. Yes, yeah. And um, it sounds to me as though the extent of the damage is still not known. If you're going to tear apart the, the customer service mm -hmm. booth still, is that correct? Yes. As long as the walls are not uh, compromised, there is no danger. Right? It's only when the wall is compromised, and that's why the restroom is shut down. That wall was compromised. The structural part of the wall that um, you're talking about, the, or just the drywall? The drywall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it says here that the estimate does not include the replacement of building materials. So, what does the not to exceed fifteen thousand cover, and what does it not cover? It's going to cover the remaining portion of uh, the uh, tear down of the walls to determine the extent of damage. So there will be more yes, to do the. And I think that raises the question of the total cost for this project, which is big question mark. Right. Um, we went through this with a city building not recently. <laughs> you start getting into every city building. Well, yeah. Anyway, we, we do um, not have an order of magnitude until they're yeah. able to tear the walls. So apart. Um, that gets me to a question about uh, an overall building assessment. And I, if, if you can tell me where that building assessment is and has, has it even um, grappled with this as this big unknown as well? Um, because all of that figures into discussions we're going to be having soon about replacement or- But not soon enough. The depressing well, story here is you're going to have to replace it whether or not we tear the whole building down. I know that the immediate the things have to be done, but um, uh, so uh, I understand. We don't know how bad this is going to get with what we currently understand, but I'd like to also just know when do we get that building assessment, how much does it cover, and um, how can we move forward on the weighing of options on this? Yes, so Director, through the Capital Committee, 
we uh, uh, initiated a full assessment of that building, yeah. which was before this to include opening up the walls mm -hmm. so that we could understand what's going on inside of that building structurally. Um, so if there was a positive to this, it was that it, it helped us open up a few more walls mm -hmm. so we could see what's going on in that building. That assessment is looking at not only structural, but electrical, uh, HVAC, flooring, plumbing, everything, yeah. so that we can get a good idea should we desire to invest in that facility and rehabilitate it, how much that would cost. That number is scheduled to be delivered to the Capital Committee, I believe you're a uh, member yeah. of that, um, in April, so that we can look at that cost of replacement rehabilitation in comparison to whatever we're going to be trying to talk about with the city about a whole new facility. Mm -hmm. So at some point, there may be a place in which it makes a lot more sense to go with the city on a new facility than to invest in the existing facility. We're trying to find out what that is. In the meantime, unfortunately, as Director Rodkin just mentioned, I have an obligation to my employees to make sure that I give them a safe this. environment. I must, you know this argument, we all have that same obligation. We must do what we have to do, and it will be a very costly fix um, to, to, to fix the problems with the windows and the walls and whatnot and get it all closed back up. Um, and it's unfortunate because I would rather use that money over on the other side of the equation, whether it be a new facility or a total rehab, but I have to do what I have to do to button it down, and this year was just extraordinary with the rains mm -hmm. and it the rain found every possible place it could find to get into that facility and made it just one big mess that we just have to fix and I've got to give our employees a good place to work. I was under the impression that that construction that facility report had been done. I'm new to capital so I don't know. There was a preliminary. Oh okay. Um, both the committee and myself were very unhappy with it. It didn't go far enough. Okay. So we directed a much larger contract to really get into every aspect of plumbing, electrical, heating, um, walls, structural, everything. And Roof. you expect that Capital Committee will have that for its upcoming meeting? Sarah, we're still on track for April, right? Yes. Um, reports from Bowen and Williams mm -hmm. uh, have indicated that they are already in the process of finalizing the report that provided to uh, Mr. Clifford for that presentation. Uh, we took advantage of the fact that these walls having been torn apart allowed them to get a better perspective of the condition of the, the uh, understructure of that building. And is that report going into the uh, uh, status of the um, uh, auxiliary rental places, you know, that you know what I mean, little shops that are separated, or only to the admin building. The stuff on the island? Yeah, the island. The kiosks. Yeah. Okay. Kiosks. kiosks, yeah. Again, the question is? Is the um, facilities report going to be uh, status of the kiosk area, or only the, the main building? No, it's, it's the main building. Okay. It's the main building. So The kiosks, um, <clears throat> we've had several tenants there that have done a lot of repair work to mm -hmm. the kiosks. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the, the most recent uh, new tenants has completely redone the interior of one of the kiosks completely. And so the the main focus was for the main building. And again, I understand the reason for that. That's our, our operational need. But yes. if we're looking at the whole facility, at some point we're going to have to look at the, the whole the business. Yeah. Okay, if we, if we can get that report as much in advance of the actual capital meetings, there's a chance to look at it, that would be really great. That is our goal. Yeah. Yeah, from the capital committee position, I, I think this actually is a, a good time for us because we had the preliminary report, which didn't meet our needs. Yeah. The secondary report did a deeper dive into what we needed to find out. And by opening up these last walls, I think this is going to give us a very good synopsis of what's actually going on in that building. So yeah, I, I think this, unfortunately, we're going to find some problems, but it's, I think it's going to give us the, the answers we want is what condition that building is really in. Director Uh Did we not have an inkling previously that this building was in trouble? Or is this a, a sudden kind of thing? I mean, it did rain last year, right? 
And so did we not know? I mean, did the preliminary report just miss it or what? We have been mandating that building for a very long time. Uh, you, you may recall that last year uh, we came to the board and asked for money to put a new roof on it and to replace all of the windows so that we could address what's causing this problem. Um, but once we got into that, it became a much deeper issue because we discovered, um, as Director Bontorf warned us, that if we're not careful, we might remove windows and discover that uh, you need to remove another part. And then and where does it end? It could become, a, a, instead of a couple hundred thousand dollar project, it could become a million dollars or more project. So we backed down from replacing the, the roof and the, the windows um, to slow it down a little bit and try to understand a little bit more about what is behind those before we start pulling them out. And then that brought us then to this winter and the um, eventuality of having to open it up anyway to look inside. How old is this facility? 1984. We were very proud of it. No. No. The day it's built, we were all excited. If I, may, if I may expand just a little bit on what Mr. Cook has indicated uh, in answering your question. The discovery of this particular situation was uh, happened this time with the rains that we experienced. It just happened to saturate the wall in that bathroom sufficiently to where it separated. So you said when it separated, that was the indication that there was a compromise to the ceiling factor, which was the wall, and that there was contamination. Correct. Yeah, well, this is depressing because uh, there's no one to blame for this. It's depressing because they're in a situation where you're spending money that probably is, you know, going to be useless in, in the long run or even the medium run. So, but there's no choice but to do it. And, you know, so I, I do support the staff uh, the recommendation. Can you tell us where we're at with the study of the underground? Uh, chemical issues under the building and stuff, because that's another factor about whether we have to tear the building down anyway or those kinds of issues. That's at the county environmental health department, or where, where's that at now? Uh, Aaron, have you heard anything from the county yet? Their deadline was sometime in March, I believe. March 15th, I haven't received their letter back. As I told you back in January and February, we submitted a final report on our analysis on January 15th allowed 60 days to get back to us. I'll follow up today. Thank you. But we, we hope to have that for the committee in April also. Yeah, because they all go together. It's a really difficult decision. Yeah. And depending on what Vero finds out, we may engage our, our county board supervisor Rex to uh, I'm trying to stay on the topic here about a serve pro. I don't know how far we're getting off. Yeah. Of I, I, have, I am prepared to move the motion because I don't think we have any choice. I, I want to open up to the public. If there's any, any other questions from the Anybody from the public want to weigh in on this topic? Seeing none, I'll bring it back. With approval of staff recommendation. Second. And motion by Rodkin, second by Leopold. And Mr. Um, yes. I know that our economic development director has also been talking with the county about the whole the soil issue as well and feeling some frustration on several fronts. And we just had a presentation from the county about their desire to work with their partners. <laughs> so let's, let's pull in that chip. Okay. Well, uh, if there's an issue that uh, one of the uh, board reps here could uh, help with, all you have to do is tell us. We just want to use that card prematurely. Yes. We, we know you're there. <laughs> we know you're there. Thank it's you for that. Not only card. <laughs> okay. Got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Um, review of items to be discussed in closed session. Thank you. We'll be discussing labor negotiation. We will not have a report out of those sessions. Okay. Um, um, is there anyone that would want to address uh, anything we're going to discuss in closed session? Seeing none, we're going to make an announcement that our next meeting will be Friday, April 26th at 9 a.m. in beautiful Scotts Valley. And with that, we'll go ahead and recess to closed session.